Good evening and welcome to our time of studying God's Word together. God has been good to us, been good to me and been good to you. Despite all that's going on around us, we can take time to thank God for His goodness. So let's do that right now. Father, we want to thank you right now for the opportunity that we have of being able to look into your Word, to feed on your Word. Your Word is not only just a lamp and a light, but your word is food to us. It's health to our bones and strength to all of us, all of our bodies, our flesh, our spirits, everything. Thank you. Speak to us now this evening again as we look into your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, this evening, let's get straight into the word of God um, because uh, we've got quite a bit to try to cover during this time. And we're looking at Hebrews chapter 2, verses 5 through 18. Hebrews 2, verses 5 to 18. And the title that I've given to this section here is, What in the World is God Doing? What in the world is God doing? So let's read from Hebrews chapter 2, verses, two, verses 5 to 18. For it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come, of which we are speaking. It has been testified somewhere, What is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you care for him? You made him for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. Now in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside his control. At present, we do not see everything in subjection to him, but we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting that he, for whom and by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. For he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source. That is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers, saying, I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation I will sing your praise. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children God has given me. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. For surely it is not angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. Therefore he had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are tempted. This is the wonderful word of God. Thanks be to God. Well, as we look into this book of Hebrews and what were the things that we've realized is that this book really so much focuses in on the person of Jesus and the superiority of Jesus, using that word better, as we said in our previous study. But when you look at it in terms of the context, in terms of the context, you see what God was doing and God has done for us in the person of Jesus. We need to reflect on history. You know, sometime during the 4th century B.C., just two years after Judea had been annexed by Rome, and almost uh, 30 years after the nephew of Julius Caesar had, had defeated Mark Anthony and Cleopatra at the Battle of Actium, and had taken on the name Augustus. Sometime after that, an old man uttered these words, 
said, And you, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High. For you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him, to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins, because of the tender mercy of our God, by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven, to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the path of peace. That's from Luke chapter 1, verses 76 to 79. And of course, we recognize that Zacharias, the father of John, is the one who uttered those words. But according to Scripture, 12 months later, angels re-echoed the word peace again when they sang to frightened shepherds on a Judean hillside, and they sang, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill to men on whom his favor rests. But even as these words were spoken, the reality is war and bloodshed were were the order of the day. So where was that peace? Where was that peace? What did God mean by peace on earth? Did he mean what we often wish he meant? The cessation of wars? If so then it would appear almost 2,000 years later that, well, more than 2,000 years now, I suppose you would say, that God has failed. So, so when the world was going through all those things, and right now the world is still going through a lot of the same things, what in the world was God doing way back then when Jesus was born? What we refer to as Christmas. If he was not attempting to bring about civil peace, what was God doing? You know, the writer of Hebrews answers that question for us in the second chapter, right here, in verses 5 through 18. And what he does is this. He, 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 he answers those questions, the question that we want to, uh, that we're asking, what in the world was God doing, or even what in the world is God doing? Because he said Jesus, and Jesus isn't finished yet. What the writer does is by highlighting three scenes in the life of our Lord Jesus. He will help us to understand what Jesus set about doing so that he could accomplish the will of his Father and provide a way for humans to have peace with God. That's the key when he talks of peace on earth, peace with God. The first thing we notice in this section here from verse 9, that Jesus accomplished his mission through his voluntary humility. In other words, the creator of angels took a position below them. As a man, he took on the limitations of living in a human body. He was hungry, he was thirsty, he got tired, he felt pain, he, he needed sleep. He had a human IQ. He was confined to one place at a time. And so the creator is limited by his creation. Philippians chapter 2, verse 7 says he emptied himself of all his divine rights, all his divine prerogatives, his divine privileges. Let a little lower than the angels. He came down, you see, to be the author of salvation. Therefore, he accomplished his mission through not only his voluntary humility, lowering himself, humbling himself, as it says there in Philippians as well, but he accomplished his mission through his vicarious sacrifice. We read that in verses 9 and 10. It says to us that he tasted death for everyone. Not for some, but for everyone. So his death to free us from sin reached across time. Yes, over 2,000 years ago. It reached across time to us today. It reached across national boundaries. It reached across social classes. It reached across the... In fact, it reached the, the, across the full breadth of human failure. That's spelled S-I-N. Jesus took the penalty. He took the judgment. He took the punishment we deserved in order that we might have peace with God. Yes. He accomplished his mission through his voluntary uh, humility, 
and through his vicarious sacrifice, but he also accomplished his mission through his vicar victorious rather ascension. We read that in verse 9. Verse 9, as we read it, verse 9 says that, uh, but we see him now, we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, now crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. His victorious ascension. Romans chapter 4, verse 25, writes, states it like this. He was delivered over to death for or because of our sins and raised to life because of our justification. Hallelujah. So because of our sins, on account of our sins, Jesus was delivered over to death. But because he did something successfully and victoriously with, in relationship to our sins, he was raised to life. As proof that what he went to the cross to do, he succeeded in doing. Romans chapter 1 verse 4 states, Who through the spirit of holiness was declared with power to be the Son of God by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ the Lord. So God declared Jesus to be his Son by his resurrection from the dead. In this just as back there in Romans chapter 4 verse 25, it says that, even though he was delivered over to, to, to death because or on account of our sins or because of our sins. Also because our justification was taken care of by his death on the cross. He was raised to life. And so, Jesus, he's the one who is now crowned with glory and honor in heaven. Why? Because he suffered death for everyone. That's what it says in this text. Because his death did purchase our reconciliation to God. So, his incarnation, his death, and his resurrection touched the, the three dimensions of human existence. It touched our life, it touched our death, and then it touched our eternity. That is, life after death. And so Jesus touched us by becoming partners with us in our humanity. He touched the very source of our problems, which is sin. Because the Bible tells us he died in our place. He purchased our forgiveness from sin. He touched, this, touched us at the very source of our problems, yes. The big problem is sin, but also the source of our fears. What happens after we die? How did he do that? Well, he arose and ascended, proving that there is life after death, proving that there is hope in Christ beyond the grave. But there's a second way in which this, this work of Jesus is described by the writer of Hebrews in the second chapter. Again, pointing to this same theme of peace with God. He says to us that our salvation was accomplished when Jesus became our brother. For our salvation, Jesus became our brother. Verse 14 says he shared in our humanity. And verse 17 says he had to be made like his brothers in every way. So he entered he in, he entered in, he became human in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest. That's from Hebrews. So, in a sense, Jesus had to feel what we feel in order to prove to us that he fully understands our problems. He said, well, God knows everything. Yes, it was not that God doesn't know everything. It's that we need to know that God knows. We need to know that God identifies with our hurts and our griefs and our pains and our problems. And so Jesus had to feel what we feel in order to prove to us that he fully understands what it is to live in a fallen world where sin and temptation is a reality and where death, in a sense, is a reality because of sin. You know, I read that there is, in East Africa, 
there is a tribe, there is a dialect that has no equivalent word for the English word mercy. So the translators of, of the Bible had a tough time and say, they tried to find, if there's no word for it, is there an idea, is there some phrase that, that expresses that same concept in such a way? And eventually they found one. The phrase was this. God is crying with us. So instead of you seeing the word mercy, if you were reading from their translation of the Bible, when you come to the word mercy, you would see this, this idea that God is crying with us. Isn't that what it means by mercy to a certain extent? That Jesus so cares about us, so identifies with our needs, that he hurts with us. He cries Uh, despite all that we may try to do to connect with our brothers and sisters, we can't do it as Jesus does. The scripture says he became our brother. But not only did he become our brother, he also, for our salvation, became our champion. He became our champion. Verse 14, by his death he might destroy him who holds the power of death, that is, the devil. So it was on the cross, it was on the cross that Jesus defeated Satan, not in the grave or not in hell. A lot of people who have this idea that Jesus, after the, he died on the cross, he went down into hell, and there in hell he took the keys from Satan and defeated Satan. I have only one question to ask you, and you tell me where you find the answer in the Bible. Where in the Bible does do you find any reference to Satan ever having the keys? Satan never had the keys to hell. If he had the keys to hell, he would find somewhere to try to lose them so well that even Jesus couldn't find them. So we have this picture in our head of the defeat of Satan taking place in hell. No, the defeat of Satan took place on the cross. That's where our victory was won. That's where our salvation was paid for fully and completely. He tasted death indeed for everyone. He destroyed, literally, he rendered, if you look at the word there in the, in the Greek, he rendered powerless, he rendered ineffective the power of Satan by his substitutionary death on our behalf. Satan's power to intimidate us by death and to hold man in death power is broken. Jesus became our brother, he became our champion, and for our salvation he also became our liberator. Verse 15 says, to free those held in slavery. Hmm. Let me tell you what, there are lots of ways in which we are enslaved today. As human beings, we can be enslaved. Speaking to some young people recently, they talked about slavery as if it were something in the past way back when, when some of our ancestors were slave, slaves and some were slave masters, and slave owners. And there are places in the world today where slavery is still a reality. But you see, there are different forms of enslavement. Fear is enslavement. Fear is enslavement. When we are afraid, we are not free. We don't have peace of mind Peace of heart to move and do and think and live the way we should. Fear is enslavement. But you know, something else is enslavement, and that is unforgiveness. And we can't let go of what people have done to us. But when we just can't let go, we, it, it's always coming up before us in our minds, in our minds. And we're brooding and mulling over the wrongs done to us. That's enslavement. And Jesus came to set us free from all kinds of enslavement. We say we want God to forgive us of our sins and to set us free. But we need to give him our fears. And we need to give him our unforgiveness and our bitterness and our dwelling in, in, in a sense almost like a hen 
setting on, on these eggs of, of unforgiveness. They bring forward a brood of death. Yes, Jesus. He died in order to make atonement, verse 17, atonement. That means to pay a debt, to make amends, resulting in a right relationship. That's why if you take the word atonement and break it down, it's at one meant. At one meant. Jesus made atonement by his death on the cross so that we could have a relationship now with God and be at peace with God. Verse 18 says he's able to help those who are being tempted. Praise God for that. We're being tempted in so many different ways. We think oftentimes, well, a temptation is, is to sin, maybe to lie, to steal, to commit adultery, to do something else. But the very things that we just mentioned, to operate or to function under the power of fear, is a temptation. To do that, to which we can yield or which, which we can resist. I've had it happen in my life on several occasions where I'm approaching something, I know, anticipating something is happening, and I can feel the spirit of fear just beginning to rise against me, come against me, and then I realize I don't have to be intimidated and destroyed and overcome by fear. And so in my heart, even if I don't say it out loud, in my heart, I take the, the, the posture and the position, no, not, in the, not today, not in the name of Jesus. I'm not going to give in to fear. Not on this watch. Unforgiveness? Yes, the things that people have did to us in the past. They would want to come up, but we, we need to bury them Love covers over a multitude of sins. When we begin to mull over the love of Christ for us, all that he has done for us, and to remember that the very people that hurt us, Christ died for them and loves them as well. And we say, Father God, even though I find it hard, you love them. Love them. Lavish your love upon them. If I deserve your love, they deserve your love. If I don't deserve your love, they don't deserve your love. But it's not a matter of deserts in the first place. The gift of salvation has been given to me. And it's free to those who've hurt me. Oh, yes. Tempted. Tempted to fear. Tempted to be unforgiving. Tempted towards bitterness. Tempted to uh, get even. Tempted to cover up for ourselves, to lie. And the psalmist says, deliver you from lying lips and a deceitful tongue. That's a prayer that Christians can pray for ourselves. If we find ourselves uh, not going quite straight with the truth. Deliver me from lying lips. Not somebody's lips who lie upon me or lie about me, but from my own lips that are saying things because I want to make myself look better in the eyes of others. God forgive so Jesus is able to help those who are being tempted because he himself, it says, suffered when he was tempted. He, he knows the hurt of temptation. And he can anticipate the hurts of yielding to it as well. For he has seen how that has happened to, some, to millions of people. He can lift us up when we are tempted, the Bible tells us. It says he is able to help. He is able to help. He entered this world as our brother. He conquered Satan as our champion. And he lifted us up from slavery as our liberator. From slaves to sons and daughters, brothers and sisters with Christ. And so, what in the world is God doing today and every day? Well, the same thing that he did way back over 2,000 years ago now, that time we referred to as that first Christmas. And then, of course, the following 2,000 plus years, the same thing, because God still comes down to us by his Holy Spirit. He still reaches across time. He still reaches across national boundaries. He still reaches across social barriers and 
and sin's barriers, calling us into a relationship with himself. And when we are liberated, when we are set free, we can join him in this enterprise of being spiritual peacemakers. We can show people that it is possible to be set free and be at peace with God, such peace with God, that we are no longer slaves to fear. We are no longer slaves to unforgiveness and bitterness and anger and resentment, self-pity, or whatever else that takes us down. Remember that Jesus Christ still reigns and he still rules in heaven. He is still Jesus, the God-man. Yes, the man with scars on his hands, his brow, his feet, his side. The man with scars that sits at the right hand of God, our Father. Well, you know what? He still has the power that he took over, the power over death. Satan had that power, but Jesus has that power. And he's still liberating. He's still freeing people from slavery, helping those who are tempted and making right the estrangement between men and God, mankind and God, making at one man. That is what God was doing thousand year, 2,000 years ago. Yes. And that is what God is doing in the world today. That is why there is Christmas and Easter and Pentecost. And every day in between. We celebrate some high points. But God is at work at all times. In all places. And so this peace that we're talking about. Peace, this relationship that we have, at one meant atonement, at one meant with God, being at peace with God. That is the peace that results when our sins are forgiven, when we accept the atonement of Jesus. When we humbly accept God's greatest gift, the gift of salvation, the gift of salvation, the gift salvation. That's why the Apostle Paul says, thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. That's not in here in Hebrews, that's in Corinthians. Thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. We can't even describe what he's done for us, but we try. We try. Let's worship God in prayer at this time. Sovereign Lord and Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, thank you for your Holy Spirit assisting us. Thank you for your Holy Spirit bringing to our minds and our memories how you have helped us, how you have liberated us, how you have strengthened us. And so, Father, we pray that right now, those who are, have taken the time to join us to listen, perhaps, Father God, they are tortured. They're, they're not at peace. They are tortured in their minds and their hearts. Tortured by fear, tortured by bitterness, unforgiveness, maybe by feeling cut off, alone, even though they're, they're Christians. Somehow or another, Lord, they don't sense that oneness with you. You haven't built up the barriers. You haven't built up the walls. Help them to know that if they let go, just let go, and you will come and Remove those barriers, remove those walls, remove those hindrances. Take away the sting of death that people are experiencing even before death. Because the Bible says the sting of death is sin. Oh Lord God, free those who will come to you now. Free them, liberate them, set them free by the power of your Spirit. Oh Lord, in this time of remembering what you have done for us, giving you thanks for your goodness and your mercy to us. Lord, and coming close to Christmas time, we remember what happened on that first Christmas and how it has 
just play it out into such wonderful things for us even today. Lord, we give you thanks now. We give you thanks. We praise your name. We pray that those who would call upon your name even now, that they would receive the gift of forgiveness and the gift of inner healing and restoration through the power of your blessed Holy Spirit. We pray these things now. Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, my brothers and sisters, thank you for spending the time with me in the Word of God. And until um, next week, I trust that you will take the time to get into to the Word, stay into studying God's Word. And if you want to review some of the things we've already covered, that's fine as well. But um, until next week, Will you remember what Jesus Christ has done for you? And remember that he is not distant. He's with you. If you're a believer, he's with you because he is in you. That's a promise he gave his disciples. He, was, he says, now the Holy Spirit is with you now, but he will then be in you. He is closer than a brother. He's in you. Call to him. Depend on him. He Heal the deepest hurts of your soul. Remember, for those of you who are part of this congregation, remember our times of prayer. We still have a Wednesday evening um, from 6 to 7 p.m. We have a Wednesday evening prayer time. Uh, and that is, that's uh, what we call in person, right there in the sanctuary. But we just started a prayer meeting, a Zoom prayer meeting. And we want to encourage you. We've had a couple of sessions so far. It's from 7 to 8 p.m. on Sunday evening. Each Sunday evening, 7 to 8 p.m. And you're free to join. If you're timid about praying, you shouldn't be timid just to listen to somebody else's prayer and be able to at least agree with them. And by, by the way, as you join, if you're timid about praying, when you join a prayer gathering, there's no pressure on you to pray. Nobody's going to say, you go ahead and pray. No. But that's how you learn to pray as well. You listen to those and you learn some things. You learn what to do maybe, what not to do. But you can learn. We, and we will take time during our sessions to sort of give some instruction as well as encouragement to simply get about the business of prayer. Jesus said to his disciples, we should pray and not faint. Pray without ceasing, the scripture tells us. And so I just want to encourage you in addition to our Sunday school on Sunday morning and our Sunday morning worship service, then these, these important sessions of prayer on Wednesday and Sunday, and of course, each Thursday evening here from 7.30, our Bible study. Until then, God richly bless you. Mm -hmm.